Caring for Kids God's Way presents attorney at law, clinical social worker, and Christian Counseling Today senior editor George O. Schlager with child counseling expert Dr. Mark Shadon, legal and ethical issues in children's work. Hello, this is George Oslager. Thank you for joining us in our continuing series on Caring for Kids God's Way. I'm joined today by my friend and colleague, Mark Shadone. Uh, the law considers a child, someone under age 18, as not able, due to the lack of adult standing, to give consent on their own. So consent lies in the parents' hands regarding the major issues that affect the child's life. Their health, their welfare, uh, their financial standing, whether or not they can engage in counseling or not is a decision ultimately that parents make for their minor children. Uh, this creates a lot of issues in counseling, especially with adolescents who are near the age of majority who are close to 18. Uh, most states, for example, allow a child to give consent at age 16 or 17 as if they were an adult. Uh, in a number of states, even children as young as age 13 or 14 can give what may be known as partial consent for emergency situations such as uh, a pregnancy, such as discovering that they may have a sexually transmitted disease, uh, some kind of abuse situation or criminal situation in which they were involved in. They can come in under this emergency situation and meet with the counselor for one or two, sometimes three sessions without contacting parents or before a counselor or a pastor needs to bring the parents in. Uh, many times a child will not, in an emergency situation, want to disclose what they are experiencing with the parent. And it's very important for the counselor to disclose to that child that the parent must be brought into the conversation at some point. Maybe this session is something that can be held in confidence, but tomorrow would you bring your parent in? Mm -hmm. You might ask as a counselor. Uh, when we meet again about this situation, how are we going to disclose this to your parents? And what do you think your parents' reaction is going to be? These are common questions that counselors need to ask in this whole process of gaining consent to continue in counseling work in the interventions that you want to engage in with the child you're working with. Uh, and, <coughs> and these are murky waters. They are murky, aren't they, Mark? They, they are. Um, yes. You know, and, 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 and most of my thinking on it is, you know, from a, a professional uh, therapist who also has not only the legal requirements, uh, but also the um, the ethical requirements of, of the board that licenses me. Yes. But then also as a Christian counselor, uh, certain uh, moral, I think moral and biblical principles that come into uh, into into the mix as well. Uh, the um, you know, and I would say there's 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 no easy answers on this when it when it gets in a gray area. For example, if, um, uh, if, if you're working with an adolescent who reveals that they're uh, having sex with their girlfriend or boyfriend, or they're drinking, or they're using uh, marijuana, uh, or uh, you know, any number of problems that we know parents would, would uh, hopefully be concerned about and, 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 and want to take some kind of action on. Mm -hmm. Um, that's one of these fine lines. Uh, if you share that information, do you lose the relationship, the rapport, and the trust with the adolescent who shuts down? And you may be the only Big question. You may be the only connector with that kid who can talk to them. Yes. So do you in, do, you, do you endanger that uh, by informing the parents? And uh, that's a tough one. And it, may, and, it, and it may be, uh, it may almost be a case-by-case -case situation. 
there's certain principles I tend to work by. Um, when I, uh, and, and I think this would go for lay counselors, pastors, youth workers, or professionals. Yes. When you're working with a kid, a, you're not a pipeline to the parent because Absolutely they, they not. will not tell you anything, and the parents need to understand that. Yes. Um, and the kid needs to understand that. But I'll set some guidelines such as, you know, if there's something really that you don't want me to tell your parents that you're doing that you know is wrong, <laughs> you probably shouldn't tell me. <laughs> because okay. I, may, I may feel, you know, as a Christian counselor, and that, that's the angle I'll take it on, yeah. that, that they need to know that. Hmm. Um, and you may not like me, and, and, and you may feel that I have broken your trust, I'm saying up front to you, I'm not going to make a decision like that without taking your care into mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing I'll say to them is if you, if, you, if you tell me not to say something, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I may respect that. Good. But one thing I'm going to say to you is let's talk about why you don't want them to know. Yes. You know, we need to have that conversation. Uh, if, you're, if you're smoking uh, uh, marijuana... And you don't want your parents to know, well, you know, it didn't take a rocket scientist to kind of figure out why. But let's talk about that. Yeah. Because their rationale may be that they think their parents are, are going to, uh, you know, overly discipline them or reject them in some way. Yeah. And the fact of it is uh, that may be part of the, the parent's adolescent experience. Mm -hmm. It may be something they have a better understanding than teenager even recognizes. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the counselor, the, the whatever whatever the, the role of the counselor is, as youth worker, or professional, you, you know, or just running a Bible study with, yes. with kids in your church, that you're that bridge a lot of times Absolutely. between the kid and, and the parent. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, there may be bigger problems that the kid has that we don't know about other than uh, some of the things that he tells us that we think are pretty big problems. There may be bigger problems. Yeah. And if you divulge things too quickly or without some kind of discussion with the child, uh, they may just clam up and bigger problems and never get talked about, never get dealt with until it's, a, it's yeah. an absolute crisis and a big mess. You walk a very fine line between maintaining the child's trust on the one hand and the parent's trust on the other. Uh, one of the things that I used to do in my clinical work was in non-emergency situations invite the whole family in and throw this whole issue of what is open to discussion and what must be kept in confidence back into the family's lap. Uh, I would ask the parents, well if your child disclosed to me that they were using drugs or having dangerous sexual behavior or engaging in this or that, you know, would you want to know about it? And the kids usually sitting there with their eyes wide open and they've never had this kind of discussion with their parents, so they're very intent on hearing what their parents have to say. And oftentimes the kid is surprised that the parents are going to deal with it differently than the child might have expected otherwise. But to have this discussion with the parents and the child present really help define some clear boundary issues about what can be discussed and what must be kept secret. The kid got a clear idea of what could be talked about and parents understood that maintaining that kid's trust was very critical for me to maintain and many parents would say, I'm going to trust you to deal with that, and unless that situation turns ugly or dangerous for my son or daughter, I am willing for you to keep that in confidence with my child. That often gave us permission and just cemented that trust relationship with the child in a way that both met my legal and ethical duties that we clearly have before the state, before the Lord, as well as continuing that counseling relationship that was so critical with an adolescent who looks upon us often as just one more adult right. who's going to impose the parents' rules on them. That's not our purpose or the point. Yeah. The, um, you know, some, somewhat of a guide rail that I, that I use and, and 
to bottom line some of this is, you know, if, if there are things that are divulged that are illegal, such as abuse. Yes. Uh, in our state, we're mandated. Uh, that it's a misdemeanor if you don't report yes. it. Uh, you have uh, three days to do so, um, but it has to be reported. Yes. And in fact, it doesn't even have to be, uh, one doesn't even have to tell the parents or the, or the child that you are going to report it. Uh, you know, that, that sometimes I think is wise to do. Um, there's probably other cases where it, it is wise not to do it, but legally you're not required to let anybody know. Yes. And in fact, your reporting is also often anonymous, anyways. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Ill, uh, things of harm, uh, which may also be illegal too, could be, uh, 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 you know, drug usage. Yes. Uh, uh, other kinds of behaviors uh, that uh, uh, selling drugs. Uh, you've got kids now going back. Violence threatened violence against others, I which had, I had, more and more young people are doing these days. I, I had uh, <laughs> one young man who uh, uh, had a locker next to uh, the local uh, middle school porn dealer, <laughs> uh, his, his locker mate. And, uh, you know, I wasn't counseling him, but if I had have been, yeah. uh, you know, all bets would have been off. I said, you know, that's... Uh, you know, that is just uh, absolutely wrong, and, and we, we need to deal with this. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, you know, the other issue is, is things that might cause them physical harm. I mean, kids who are having sex and, uh, uh, you know, kind of indiscriminately or, or unsafely. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that, <coughs> that can be something that, that uh, you know, uh, may need to be may need to be told if the child's not willing to deal with that issue, not willing to take uh, precautions, not willing to in some case stop. Yes. Uh, uh, you know that may be something that the parents do need to know about. And increasingly, a lot of kids define sex as having intercourse and don't even consider oral sex and other sexual right. behaviors as having sex or being sexual with someone else. Uh, there's a variety of terms that kids have for it, but you may need to get a clear definition of what exactly. sex means from the child you're working with uh, because it doesn't mean to them what we have understood it to mean uh, for our lifetimes, for example. Um, so having the child define some of their own terminology is very critical in the work you do with them. I think in, in, in the cases where uh, I've worked with situations where a teenager or, or a young person, something needed to be divulged, you know, the lion's share of those situations, the parents handled very well. Yes. I think one of the areas where parents tend to really uh, flip out is, is around the, uh, the whole issue of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, parents who find their uh, young uh, pubescent boy uh, on the internet looking at uh, homoerotica uh, porn, you know, that, that tends to uh, freak parents out. I think we can mm -hmm. understand why. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes that isn't handled very well when it gets into some of these less than normal kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean they're going to stay that way. Um, that doesn't mean that that reaction isn't going to come down to something reasonable and workable and, and and I can't think of the situation in the years I've practiced where I've had some parent who's just been so unreasonable about something that they made the therapy or the counseling or whatever the church is trying to do to help a kid you know uh, uh, you know impossible good yes so I would encourage folks that yeah sometimes the the, the initial reaction yeah it may be difficult but that's part of our role too, is that bridge yes. uh, between the child, the adolescent, and the uh, and the parent is is to help the parents deal with this stuff. Yes, uh, and, and have a focus that's going to work. You touched upon abuse situations, which we as professional therapists are mandated to disclose, uh, and. Of course, I would love to have the church consider itself to be a mandatory reporter. 
Uh, and sometimes, in fact, you are in a church setting. There mm -hmm. are some pastors in some states who are designated as mandatory reporters, especially those who are administrators of Christian mm -hmm. schools mm -hmm. or are directly involved in the supervision of children's ministries where the state defines anyone uh, in such a role as a professional is a mandatory reporter. It's important to know whether you are a mandatory reporter or not as you are obligated to report in Virginia within three days, in some states within 24 hours, some states 36 hours, other states two days. Uh, it depends on the state you're in, but within 24 to 72 hours, you are required to make a report to your local Child Protective Services Agency, whatever it's called, and that CPS agency may or may not investigate from that point. Many CPS agencies are so overwhelmed with cases that only the most serious kinds of abuse reported get investigated and get acted upon. So it's not even clear whether or not there will be a follow through by an agency uh, designated uh, with a legal responsibility to protect children. But if you must make a report, do so. What are you to report? Well, if you have a reasonable suspicion, uh, you're not even required to affirm or, or validate the information you have. But if you have, uh, it's an, and it's a reasonable person standard, if you have a good instinct, a reasonable suspicion, that abuse has happened and when a child reports directly that they are being abused physically, sexually, or neglected to the point that their basic welfare is not being taken care of, you've got an obligation to report that to state officials. What is physical abuse? Well, it's non-accidental physical injuries. If you see bruises on a child and those bruises don't make any sense from the story that you're being told for mm -hmm. most clinicians that creates a suspicion and in situations of sexual abuse we often find a an adult or even a minor mm -hmm. child increasingly involved in being the sexual perpetrator against a younger child and research indicates that most professional counselors tend to report sexual abuse more than physical abuse or neglect and that CPS agencies may not consider sexual abuse as critically important sometimes as physical abuse. Again, depending on the caseloads and the demands on the agency, it's difficult to predict sometimes what is going to be investigated. You know, one of the, um, the areas that, that uh, I think disturbs, has disturbed me the most over the years in, in terms of this whole regard, I don't have an option as a licensed clinical social worker in our state to um, make a decision not to report something if yes. I think it's happening. Yes. Uh, but I have had numerous situations over the years where a, a youth pastor, uh, a, uh, a lay counselor, someone in that position who in our state is not mandated to report. Yes. And, and they have known about sexual abuse or they've yeah. had suspicions or they've known about physical abuse and have chosen to not report it only because they legally don't have to. Yes. And I think there's a moral responsibility as a Christian, whether we're mandated by laws or not, uh, to report those things. And, and the reason Boy, I say that big, is big because issue. by the time someone finds out, it's been going on for a period of time anyways, in most cases. Yes. And if it hasn't, you certainly don't want it to go on longer. Yes. Uh, but in, in the cases where that's, that situation has uh, come to me, how much l less pain, how much less crisis, how much less sin would have been stopped 
Yes. If a, if a Christian worker had done what I think Jesus Christ would want him to do, is to confront, and, they, and a lot of his people don't even confront it with the perpetrator. Yes. You know, I've heard this is going on, or I have this concern. Don't even do that. And I think it's an outrage. And it's, it's something that, folks, it's scary to do. It is. And nobody likes doing it. Yeah. Uh, but it's one of those things that must be done. And the other end of it is, I think people get into this mentality that they have to determine if the sexual abuse is really happening or not. Yes. We're not the judge. Yeah. We're not the investigator, whether it's in the role of the therapist or a layperson reporting it. We're simply reporters. Yes. We may be wrong. That'd be kind of nice. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I'd rather be wrong about it and have to deal with that situation. Yes. Uh, but to to simply stand by and do nothing, I think is 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 morally wrong. I don't see how anyone as a Christian can justify that. And, and, I, and I, your situation, Mark, is exactly the reason I would like churches to assume they are mandatory reporters. Abs absolutely. For this kind of situation. Another piece of the pain is that this is one area where churches, and I'm talking about the entire church staff up the supervisory chain, are most frequently sued, is in situations where someone knew about abuse and didn't intervene. Or they intervene thinking they themselves could handle the situation and the abuse went on with another person or went on secretly and silently or they accepted the repentance of someone and then relaxed controls after a few weeks or months and the abuse starts again. Uh, when you bring the state in, the state takes responsibilities off your shoulders, off the shoulders of the church that need to be taken off and that will stop a pattern often of generational abuse even that's gone on in families for maybe a hundred years. Uh, it's mm -hmm. critically important to get the state involved and I know there are some CPS agencies who are not fun to work with who consider that even corporal punishment is abuse and is wrong. We know that that's wrong. Nonetheless, there is usually one person in every CPS agency that's Absolutely. worth working with. And if you know one person, they know someone else in their agency, request that person, go to them, get them involved. If you are the counselor, make yourself available to CPS, to the family, to the church, Often counselors or youth workers are afraid they're going to lose the trust of the families. Yeah. I found that, you know, it's a coin flip. Sometimes you do, but in many situations you don't. Many times a family is incredibly relieved to have this situation finally brought out in the open and addressed in a way that could not be addressed in any other context. So, if there's abuse, report it. And and if a family, lo if you, if a person, if the reporter, whoever that person is, loses the trust that they had in a working relationship with that family, um, that is probably more to do with that family's uh, manipulation or, or lack of cooperation to deal with the problem. Yes. And my guess is whatever you've learned about is the tip of the iceberg. Yes. Uh, and be, be wary that someone who may be hurting their children may also, uh, and again, it happens, we need to understand this, but that's the same kind of person that may hurt your child when they're over visiting yes. that friend. Or that may be the, the person who is in a leadership role with children for the reasons we stated yes. earlier. Good. Uh, well done. It, it needs to be stated. Okay. Let's go back to consent issues if we can. I know we got into abuse as it came up very naturally in our conversation, but there's another consent issue that we need to address, and that's around the increasingly common situation of divorce and custodial problems, especially as more and more joint custody rulings are made by the court. 
uh, both the father and the mother may have joint custody with primary physical custody of the child residing in one parent even though the other parent has full legal rights and must be consulted and negotiated with around any major questions affecting the child. That's a very difficult situation when the parents are in significant conflict and you as a pastor or as a counselor get wrapped up in that conflict. You're caught in a dilemma between the law demanding consent from both parties but maybe practically only one party can really give it and sometimes, sometimes often, I hate to say, one party wants to close out the other from having any influence in those custodial, in those consent decisions affecting counseling mm -hmm. issues. Mark, I suppose you deal with this all the time in your practice. Huh? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it, it, when it's, when it's a problem, it's a big problem because you're getting caught up in the, the conflict and the history that two adults have with each other that's yes. getting now played out uh, in, in the therapy or the counseling arena. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, uh, they try to pull the counselor or the lay counselor or the church worker into the mix. Yes. And what's important to understand, I think, is that uh, theoretically, parents need to know what's going on with their child, uh, whether they're living at home with them or not. The, the, both parents therapeutically need to be made as much a part of the counseling or whatever work is being done with the kid mm -hmm. as, can be, as can be gotten. Uh, That's a critical but, term, as yeah, can be as, gotten. As, as can be gotten. Because often we can't get it uh, yeah. as clearly as we'd we, like. We can't. Uh, this is very murky. I think that the, uh, you know, the typical situation you have, unfortunately, is the dad is not the custodial parent. Mm. The dad may be the, uh, uh, the person who is struggling with the time spent with the, the child. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the child is wanting time with the father. Uh, the father may be you know, dating someone or involved in other things. And, uh, uh, you, you know, it's a very difficult situation. Well, in that case, the dad needs to be invited directly into the process. Mm -hmm. He needs to be, whichever parent it is, not to pick one dad. And dads, likely but, that invitation is not going to come from his ex-wife. I mean, if it can be, great, but I, if, if it can't be, then, then the therapist, the, the worker, has to uh, initiate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it's really helpful to have a session, I'm talking about from a counseling point of view, have a session with that, that uh, non-custodial parent, yes. problem parent, and get their side of things, because generally there is another side. Yes. And also they may times have, feel that they have been uh, left out, or uh, don't think that they're as important, and having them involved, being invited into the process, really challenges that and, 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 uh, and, and does breed some cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, and that way the parent can learn what needs to be learned, live action. Yes, good. Mark, thank you very much. I appreciate your input Welcome. and your participation in this video. And I want to communicate to everyone out there, especially in your work with children, stay covered, okay? Mm -hmm. Stay connected to your agency, to your church, to your supervisor, to someone who provides you with an umbrella of protection in that work that you do. When you've got someone that you can go and talk to about the issues that you face, when those issues become overwhelming to you, it's critically important for the care of that child and for your protection legally and ethically that you have that person to go to. Don't be a lone ranger. Don't be no. someone out there doing things on your own without that support and covering of someone who will protect you. I want to thank everyone who has invested their time and energy in this Caring for Kids God's Way program. I trust this series of videos will be helpful to you in your ministry to kids. 
So on behalf of all the presenters, on behalf of Tim Clinton and the whole AACC team, thank you very much. Good day to you.